<laughs> when I was young, Dad was teaching me how to whistle, and I asked, why do you whistle? And Dad told me that whistling makes you feel happy. And he told me about a song, Give a Little Whistle. I'm going to read just a few parts of the lyrics to you. When you get in trouble and you don't know right from wrong, give a little whistle. When you meet temptation and the urge is very strong, give a little whistle. Not just a squeak, pucker up and blow. And if your whistle's weak, yell, Jiminy Cricket. Take it straight, take the straight and narrow path. And if you start to slide, give a little whistle. And always let your conscience be your guide. Always let your conscience be your guide. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Central Presbyterian Church. Good morning. Whether you're a member or a guest, we are glad you're here to worship with us today. Members and guests alike, please sign the ritual of friendship as it's passed down from the center aisle. And, a, and there's, uh, we'd like to get out a special welcome to those who are worshiping with us online this morning. Um, call your attention to the bulletin. There's a few things I'm going to go over. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, the session will be meeting tomorrow night at 6, and the diaconate will be meeting at 6.30 on Thursday. As always, your prayers for the leadership of Central Presbyterian Church is very much appreciated. Wednesday night meals and adult bridge began last Wednesday. It was a great time of fellowship and fun. Dinner is from 5.15 to 6. The menu is in the bulletin. The adult class begins at 6 in the fellowship hall. This, this week we will explore what it means to be made in the, in the image of God through reflection. Make plans to attend now. The mission committee would like to invite the congregation to a thank you luncheon on February 27th. Following worship, to thank Central for its generosity in giving to missions. There will be a brief presentation of thanksgiving from those whom we support, and we, and we invite you to kick off this year's mission drive with great enthusiasm. An invitation is in the bulletin, so please take a look. Um, please speak with Jackie Lawless in the church office if you have any new church directory information. Lastly, your prayers are appreciated for all in need of healing, wholeness and comfort, spoken and unspoken, especially people beneath the steeple. This listed in your bulletin. Keep them in your prayers. I'm happy to report that Betty Phillips is home <clears throat> from the hospital and doing very well. Let us now continue to prepare for worship.
Please stand as you're able for the call to worship. A table is set before us. A feast is prepared for us. A meal of bread and wine. A meal that opens our eyes to more than just bread and wine. The Lord calls us to his supper of remembrance. The Lord calls us to serve and to be served. As we break the bread and share the cup, But we will never forget Christ's example. We will never forget the full extent of his love. Let us worship the God who is making all things new. God invites us here today. Christ sits the table before us. But as we approach the table, remember all the ways in which we fall short of God's will in our life. But we are offered grace, grace to confess, grace to begin again. So with the knowledge of that gracious gift to us, let us confess our sins before God and each other. Let us pray. Living Christ, on that night long ago, you knew that your hour had come. You knew full well what lay ahead of you. Your disciples loved you and followed you, but they were also there with you. They would be there with you in the end of that night, and no one would betray you. 
Yet you wash their feet as a servant would, even the feet of your betrayer. We are also beloved. May we be like you, Master, servant of all. May we all see how we long to be your grateful disciples. May we all see how we love each other, just as you have loved us. Amen. One of those who loves us gives us a new commandment to love one another as the Lord has loved us. You are to love each other. Let's see all the love, all this love among you and glorify God. Let us all see how you belong to Christ. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this gift of love and grace. going to call the children to come forward now, but instead of sitting on the steps like we normally do, if you could please fill this space right here in front of my feet. I'm going to look at your eyes this way this morning and your parents' eyes too. Good job listening. All right, I have, I have brought something to show you today, okay? So we're going to do a little game here. I'm going to show you two pictures, okay? Inside the pictures, you might notice some hidden pictures, okay? So as I walk these pictures around very slowly, I want you to just observe with your eyes, okay? Don't say anything with your mouth. Just look with your eyes, Okay, I want you to try to see as much as you can possibly see. And then when I take the picture away, I'm going to ask for you to raise your hand and share what you saw. Okay? All right, so this first part, keep your lips zipped because you don't want to give away the answers to anybody. I want you to tell me what you see in this picture. Look at it really carefully. What do you see? All right, I'm looking for some raised hands here. What did you see in this picture? Michael, what did you see? A tree. Very good. I saw a tree, too. Graham, did you see something else? Oh, you saw some animals. Okay. Did you see something else? Benjamin, did you see something else? Okay, very good. Campbell, did you see something else? Oh, you might have seen a gorilla. If you were looking very carefully, you also saw the face of a gorilla. The tree is the obvious one. Everybody sees the tree. But it took a couple of minutes of this picture laying on my desk this week for me to be able to see the gorilla. And you might have seen one other thing. I need one other volunteer. What else did you see, Colt? It's like a lion or a tiger. You're right. Very good. I couldn't trick any of you. All right, I have one more because it, it's kind of fun. All right. Look carefully with your eyes. Don't 
say anything with your mouth. I think this one's harder personally. What do you see? I bet you see one thing, James. All right, raise your hand and tell me what you see. What do you see? James, what do you see, buddy? A duck. Very good. The easy one to see there is the duck, right? The whole picture. But what else do you see? Look carefully. What else do you see, Liliana? A rabbit. If you look very carefully, you also see a rabbit. Very good. Anybody else? I might have to use my cheat sheet. I think there's one more inside of here. Anything else? Daniel, do you see anything else? Hmm? Here it is. There's the rabbit. I think it's just the rabbit and the duck. You're right. I don't think there was a second one in that one. Very good. Well, I showed you these interesting pictures for a reason today. You know, sometimes we don't always see what is there. For example, the tree was very easy to see, and we quickly look at the tree, and we see it, but we don't sometimes take the time to look for the extra details, like the gorilla or the lion that were hidden inside. In our story today, and I have to say it's one of my favorite stories, and I'm sorry if you were at Acolytes, I shared it with you on Wednesday too, so you just have to hear it again. Jesus is walking down the road with some other men, but the trick here is that the other men do not know it is Jesus, okay? These two men are having a conversation because, see, Jesus had just been crucified. And they're talking all about the events and what has happened. And Jesus comes up and he, he asks the men, he says, oh, what are y'all talking about? And they kind of look at him with a funny look on their face because it's kind of like, uh, duh, what else would we be talking about? We're talking about all of the things that have happened over the past few days. Our Lord has been taken. He has been crucified. And two women went to the tomb this morning, and they say that Jesus isn't even there. And an angel has told them that Jesus is alive. So they continue on their journey. They reach a stopping point. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus was going to keep going, but the men encouraged Jesus to stay with them. And they, they kind of made a camp there, I imagine, and they started to eat a meal. And in, in that moment, when Jesus took the bread and he broke it, what did the other two men realize? We talked about it on Wednesday, right, Jack? What did they realize when he took the bread and he broke it? That he was Jesus. All this time, they had been walking down the road, talking to this man who they believed was a stranger. But in fact, it was their Lord. You know, when we think about that story, it kind of reminds me that in life, sometimes, we feel like we're on the road, just like those strangers were on the road. And sometimes we feel like we're alone on that road, and we can feel pretty sad on that road. But what we don't realize sometimes is just like the men in that story didn't realize Jesus was with them, even though we can't see him, he is with us along the way. So that's what I want you to remember. It's hidden sometimes from us, but he is always there. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes that we might recognize that Jesus is with us as we walk through life's journey. We trust in him as he guides us in our daily walk, and in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being such good listeners. If you're going to Children's Church, line up at the door right there. Please bow your head for our prayer for illumination. Lord, our God, in the readings and 
proclamation of your word, we pray you will illuminate our minds and hearts so that we may hear and understand your word, know and live according to your word, and be become living letters of your word, equipped to follow Jesus in every part of our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord, the living word. Amen. The epistle reading today comes from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord that I also handed to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Hear now the gospel reading for today, Luke 12, 24, beginning with verse 28, just a part of the story of the walk to Emmaus. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now ne nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. About 10 years ago, I attended a Presbyterian continuing education event and heard a great sermon there by uh, Father Robert Hansel, an Episcopal priest. I didn't take notes. I don't remember what he titled his sermon or precisely what he said, but his core idea has stuck with me over this past decade. And the sermon that you are about to hear is my own version of his basic message that day. So if you get anything at all out of this message, all credit goes to the Lord and to Father Hansel. Let me begin. Some of the most famous people in our time have been known by signature actions. In the sports world... Basketball great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was known for his sky hook. Baseball great Ichiko, Ichiro, um, gosh, what was his last name? I know him by Ichiro, but he always touched his right sleeve whenever he went up to bat. Golfer Tiger Woods in his winning days was known for his arm and fist pump when he made a good shot. In the entertainment world, I noticed that comedian Carol Burnett is still known for tugging on her right ear. Late night talk show host Johnny Carson would always do his golf swing before his nightly monologue. And talk show host Conan O'Brien is known for his string dance. The late Fred Rogers had his own signature actions as well. Fred was... Uh, educated at one of our Presbyterian seminaries, uh, Pittsburgh Seminary, and was the only Presbyterian minister ever ordained in our denomination uh, to work in children's ministry through television. Fred, as you may know, uh, once hosted the PBS uh, children's show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And those of you who remember watching that show know that he started off every show by doing 
four things. First, he would come into the house through the front door and close it behind him. And then he would start singing the opening song. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Won't you be mine? Could you be mine? And as he was singing that song, he would go to his closet, take off his suit coat, and put on a sweater. And then he would sit down and take off his uh, dress shoes and put on his tennis shoes. Those four, four actions were the way that you knew for sure that it was Mr. Rogers starting a new episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It may or may not surprise you to know that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, also had four defining signature actions of his own by which he had come to be known by his disciples in both his early life, earthly life and in his resurrection. In our story this morning, the moment Jesus' disciples recognized the stranger at the dinner table as the risen Christ was when he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. The story says that at that very moment, the moment of those four signature actions, the disciples' eyes were opened and they recognized the risen Lord in their midst. Take, bless, break, give. Those were Jesus' four defining signature actions. He must have carried out those four actions many times in his earthly life for his disciples in Emmaus to recognize by those actions that they had the risen Lord in their midst. We know for sure that Jesus did the four at the feeding of the 5,000. And then he did the four again at the feeding of the 4,000. In each case, the story says, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and gave it. He did it again in the upper room on the night before his death when he celebrated the first communion with his disciples. And then he did it again in the house at Emmaus. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Corinth, would recall the four signature actions of Jesus. These were the four by which Jesus became known. The gospel stories associate uh, Jesus and his four defining signature actions always with food. But when I play with these stories, my holy imagination makes me think that Jesus did it at other times and did it a lot. My guess is that Jesus took these four actions whenever he was given something in life. It had become his natural, automatic response to being presented with a gift of some kind. Take, bless, break, give. I want to get our bodies involved in our learning today. I want today's message to get deep in our bones and on our muscles. My experience tells me that when our bodies are joined to our heads it makes for a powerful and memorable learning experience. I want to lead you this morning through a four-part exercise with your arms and hands. Yes, we're going to do a little exercise in church today and try not to bonk the person next to you or in front of you. I'm going to demonstrate for you a four-part movement and after I demonstrate it for you, I will want you to do it on your own. So pay close attention. Start by imagining that someone has placed a gift out in front of you. And with your hands, you reach out, you take that gift, and you bring it into your chest. Next, you take that gift that's in your hands, and you open your hands and lift it up. And then you take that gift, surround it with your hands, and break it. And then you give it. Take, bless, break, give. You follow me? Take, bless, break, give. Take, 
bless, break, give. Well done, by the way. Now let me comment on those four actions. First take. Jesus teaches us that when someone gives you a gift, however small or large or in between, you honor God and that person whenever you humbly accept it, receive it, and take possession of it. You will remember that before the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus was presented with a little boy who was willing to share his lunch that day of five barley rolls and two sardines. The lunch was presented to Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He took it. He didn't refuse it. He didn't reject it. He didn't make fun of it. He took it seriously. He received it. He accepted it. He took possession of it. 5,000 people needed to be fed that day. And in response, this little lunch was presented. Jesus took it. Jesus entertained the idea that that little lunch could very well be the way that God had chosen to meet the need of 5,000 that day. Sometimes someone offers us a gift and in the moment it may seem too small to us, too trivial, too inconsequential, and so we might reject it out of pride. We lack imagination and we're dismissive of what looks like to us a too small of a gift. Other times, someone offers to us a huge gift and we reject it out of a false modesty. Oh, oh no, no, that, that's too much. I could never accept that. I heard a story once of an American surgeon who went over to India and did a life-saving surgery on a little boy and didn't charge the family for it. The boy's mother was so grateful that she wanted to do something for the surgeon, so she ran home quickly and came back and put a chicken egg in his hand. She was so poor that that was all she had to give him, but she was so grateful that she just had to give something. The surgeon said that he felt embarrassed receiving that egg from that woman because he knew that he himself was so rich compared to her, and that egg might be the only thing she had to eat that day. But he also knew that he must accept that gift. To deny that woman a chance to give out of thanksgiving would have been a humiliation to her. She needed to give. She needed a practical way to say thanks. And he needed to accept her gift. Jesus also teaches us to take, to receive, to accept whatever gift someone's trying to give us. Whatever comes into your life in any way, no matter how small, how big, or in between, you take it rather than reject it. Taking, receiving, accepting the gift is the beginning of a sacramental or holy transaction in the world. Jesus teaches us next that after you take whatever gift you are given in this life, you bless it which means two things. First, to bless means to thank God for something, to acknowledge that God is ultimately the giver of that gift, a God who often chooses to give us gifts through other people. You don't complain to God about the gift. You don't grouse about it being too small or too big or not enough or anything else. You thank God for it because everything in life comes to you from God. To bless also has a second meaning, which is that you are asking God to take that gift and convert it from something human and ordinary and limited to something divine, sacred, and extraordinary. To bless something is to ask God to do with that gift what only God can do. When you bless a gift that you have received, you are offering it up to God, giving it back to God and asking God to do something with that gift that goes beyond anything you could do with it yourself. Something that may go beyond your wildest dreams and to make it a blessing to others. 
The third thing Jesus does with the gift is to break it. That is, he gets it ready to share. Jesus doesn't just take the five loaves and turn around and give to them whole to the disciples. He breaks them first. He prepares them in anticipation of giving them away. He breaks them down into their component parts. He divides them. He separates them. There is some work to do with the gift before he can actually share it. Every gift we receive in this life may well be multifaceted and meant for more than one person. And it requires some preparation on our part before we can share it. And when we bless the gift, when we offer it up to God for God to use it in a way that blesses others, God gives us wisdom as to how to get that gift ready for sharing. Finally, Jesus teaches us to take whatever gift we have received and after blessing it and preparing it, to give it away, to share it, to distribute it to others. Jesus teaches us that God meant all of us to be a kind of flow through for the gifts of God. We were not meant to hoard our gifts or store them up, to stack them up, to keep them permanently, but to give them away. God gives us gifts in order that we might have something to share. The wonderful ending of the feeding of the 5,000 is that when Jesus took the little boy's lunch, small though it seemed, and dealt with it sacramentally, taking it, blessing it, breaking it, and giving it. It became enough and more than enough for all 5,000 that day. I've come to believe with Father Hansel that when Jesus took, blessed, broke, and gave bread at so many meals, he wasn't just acting as host and making sure everyone got enough bread. He wasn't just hosting the first communion. He was giving his original disciples and us a whole new approach to living. How do we know when the risen Christ is present with us? We know when we see each other living our lives as Christ. That is sacramentally taking each thing that's given to us in this life, blessing it, breaking it, and giving it away. Amen. As we prepare to receive our morning offering, hear this from the Apostle Paul. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Let us receive the morning offering.
We thank you, O God, for the blessings and gifts you have provided us in abundance. And we thank you for the privilege of sharing them with you, with your church, and with your wider world. We ask that you would take these, our gifts, bless them, break them, and give them away according to your holy purpose. We pray in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our uh, servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. We are gathered this morning, among other things, to ordain and install uh, new elders and deacons today. And at this time, I would invite up to the front all of you who are coming forward today to be uh, in, in ordained and or installed as elders or deacons. And our uh, clerk of session, Dan Buchanan, will uh, introduce them to you as they come. Thank you, David. I think before we start focusing as we should and as is appropriate, our newly ordained and installed officers, I want to take a moment to thank very much, very much so, the, the uh, class of 2021. Uh, they have worked hard this year. They've had extended duty, so to speak. Uh, there's been a lot of things going on within the church, exciting things, I guess probably the most exciting, other than, than acquiring a wonderful interim pastor was the COVID, and that came to town, and our session dealt with it um, quite well. I want to thank all of you who are retiring as of the end of this service today, technically. Uh, any members of the class that is retiring, either deacon or elder, if you would stand and let us thank you. Good. <laughs> On behalf of the central congregation who called them into service and representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Jesus Christ, the session today ordains the following church members to the office of elder. Kyle Anderson, Jimmy Anderson, Trey Thomas, and John Walters, and installs them for active service on the session. And the session installs those who have been previously ordained as elders, Bucky Cole, Lee Watson, Karen Hancock, Randy Fisher, and Amy Sanciola. The session also ordains the following church members to the office of deacon, Laurie Stroop and Metra Lehman, and installs them for active service on the diaconate and installs on, on the diaconate those who have previously been ordained, April Cameron and Jan Hinchman if all of those would come forward. So wonderful to see all of you up here. And it has been a rather long process of, of classes, of preparation, and of discernment for you all. And I am very blessed to be able to ask you the institutional or constitutional questions. In baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, 
and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions, and I will give you prompts. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, acknowledging him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal, and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. I do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God if so say I do and I will will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions if so say I will Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among other, your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. Will you seek in your own life to seek the, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and to work for the reconciliation of the world. I will, do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do, and I will. I will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, say, I will. I will. And for the elders, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. For deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people with God's help to, in friendliness and to those in need. And in your ministry, we try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ. If so, say, I will. And now for the questions to the congregation. If you all would join me in standing and respond to the the questions as, as required by the Book of Church Order. Do we, the members of the church, accept these members as elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, please indicate by saying, we do. We do. do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us? serving Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the first of the church. If so, please indicate by saying, we do. We do. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, at this time, I invite uh, all of you who are being ordained uh, this morning, either as elders or deacons, to make your way towards these cushions. We will have you kneel, but not yet. And at this time, I would invite all of you who have ever been ordained and installed as an officer of the Presbyterian Church, either a deacon, elder, or minister, to come up front and to lay hands on these and to pray with them.
All right, at this time, if you're being ordained as an elder or a deacon, would you please kneel on these pillows provided for you? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, in obedience to your call, confirmed by an inner call and by the call of this congregation, we now ordain and install as elders Kyle Anderson, Jimmy Anderson, Trey Thomas, and John Waters. And we install those previously ordained as elders, Bucky Cole, Lee Watson, Karen Hancock, Randy Fisher, and Amy Cianzola. And we ordain and install as deacons, Lori Stroop and Maitre Lehman. And we install those previously ordained as deacons, April Cameron and Jan Hinchman. God of mercy, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of them, that they may be faithful elders and deacons in the church. Give them openness to the Spirit's leading, wisdom to discern the needs of our church, vision for the future, an active life of prayer, hunger to study your word, humility together with authority, and love for your people and the world. Grant them patience in adversity, hope in moments of disappointment, firmness and forgiveness in correcting the wayward, and courage to lead your people in the way of Christ. Grant them joy in all they do and an abiding sense of your presence. Guide this church through these servants. Instill in this congregation a willingness to support and encourage them in their ministry always. Through Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer, amen. I invite you now to stand. Kyle, Jimmy, Amy, Randy, Karen, Trey, John, Lee, Bucky. You are now elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. April, Jan, Lori, and Maitre. You are now deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. I charge you to be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. I now invite all of you who have been previously ordained and installed as officers of, of the church to welcome these new elders and deacons with the right hand of fellowship. God bless you. Today is a celebration of many things, the newness of leaders who have, been, who have heard God's call to serve, the continued blessing of gathering here for worship as a community of faith, 
and to celebrate the goodness and richness of God's grace at this table, the Lord's table. Christ our Lord invites us to this table for all who love him and who trust in him and who earnestly seek to live with one another in peace. This is a uniting table where family comes to sit and dine. It is not my table or your table. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is a Lord's table. And all who trust in him are welcome to come and partake of the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. You formed us in your image, loved us with an everlasting love, and graced us with gifts for serving. When we were faithless and would not follow, you forgave us and returned us to your way. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, your only begotten and beloved, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. By your Holy Spirit, he anointed all who would follow him to live a new life in your love. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Baptized as one among us, he received the gift of your Spirit and claimed his calling as a servant of your reign. Jesus proclaimed good news to the poor and by the power of your word set people free from all that bound them. He broke open the bread of life for all who were hungry and upon the hurt and the lost poured out the living waters of your grace. In humble obedience, Jesus went to his death on the cross and was raised up by your power to reign in glory. In the resurrection, the gifts of his spirit were poured out upon your people that the church might embrace his ministry and live as his body in the world. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Build up the body of Christ in your love and equip the church for the work of ministry. Make us one body in Christ where one's gifts are honored and used for the good of all, where all submit to one another in humility and in the bond of the Holy Spirit. Send us out into the world to do justice, to show mercy, and to walk humbly with you in trust and faith. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until that promised day of resurrection when with the redeemed of all the ages we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and forever. Now hear us, Lord, as we pray all together the prayer given to us by Jesus Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Bible tells us that on the night of his arrest, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. In the same way as was the custom, he took the cup and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, too, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our Lord until he comes again in glory. And indeed, 
you will. Today we will celebrate communion by passings, by the passing of trays. It has been two years since we have done this, so it's a big day for us all. The passings of, tray, of trays where we serve one another reminds us that we are all servants to and with one another. Also, serving communion is the first act of these newly ordained and installed elders as they seek to serve this congregation. This is a holy re reminder of who we are and whose we are, Jesus Christ. The trays have communion packets in them. Please hold your packet until all have been served, including the elders, and then we'll take the bread first, showing the unity of our congregation, and then the cup showing the universal salvation that we all have in Jesus Christ. So I now invite the elders to come forward. Please tear open your bread. 
the body of Christ broken for us all. The blood of Christ shed for us all. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have gathered us at this table with all the company of your people in heaven and on earth. In your mercy, we have been nourished by the living bread, Jesus Christ, and we have been refreshed by the power of your Holy Spirit. May we who have shared this holy meal go out as glad disciples of our Lord, following in his way, proclaiming his truth, and living his love for the world. Amen. New and continuing elders and deacons model for this church sacramental living, taking everything that God has given to you individually and as a whole church, blessing it, breaking it, and giving it away. And all of you who are part of this congregation, follow the model of your leaders, elders and deacons and ministers in sacramental living. Join me one more time. Take, bless, break, give. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us all this day and forevermore. Amen.